As you know, we had a busy week. We had a function last night and we've got Nicholas Hasluck tonight. So welcome to everyone, both here in, in Sydney and those who are following us on Zoom, where Nicholas Hasluck makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute on the occasion of the publication of his book, Print and Prize, Travels in the Commonwealth. And there'll be copies of that book on sale tonight and also online after the event and we'll have autographed copies of the book. So uh, Nicholas is well known, so I'm going to introduce him very briefly. Um, he's, he's, um, he studied law in Perth and then at Oxford before serving, uh, becoming a barrister and then serving as a judge in the Supreme Court of Western Australia. He's written 14, 14 novels and various other books on other matters, including the current one. And tonight, Nicholas Hasselak is going to talk on the topic, Truth-Telling and Post-Colonial Critiques, Reflections on the Commonwealth Writer's Prize. Nicholas Hasluck, you're very welcome. this. How's that? Good. Well, good evening to you all and let me begin by thanking you all for coming out on a night like this. Uh, that is much appreciated and let me also thank uh, Jared and the Institute for inviting me to give this address. Now time is precious on uh, an occasion like this so let me plunge right into the topic I have before me, truth-telling and post-colonial critiques. Now, I begin by saying that we are living in unreal times, an era in which political activists and others seem increasingly inclined to characterise the putting of any view contrary to their own as the spreading of misinformation, in quotes. They commend truth-telling, a term now often linked to the writing of wrongs in former colonies without being clear as to what exactly they mean. This was evident in last year's Voice to Parliament referendum. At an early stage of the campaign, proponents of the Yes case including universities, big companies, and surprisingly, to my way of thinking, almost all sectors of the legal profession. And that stance seemed to common to them all seemed to be in the ascendant. They spoke with great assurance about the right righteousness of their cause. Their sanctimonious tone, I believe, had the unfortunate side effect of curtailing debate. At this early stage of the campaign, to express an opposing view seemed shameful. But in the end, the no case prevailed. The proposal to create a parliamentary privilege for people of Aboriginal descent, albeit well meant, was seen as a bridge too far, apparently. Now, were speakers for the no case spreading misinformation when they contended that a special privilege based on race was divisive, that it was contrary to the democratic ideal of equality between citizens, that in any event, reforms could be carried out via the current statutory process. Questions like this, I submit, remind us that nowadays the line between truth and falsehood, fact and fiction, argument and misinformation is often blurred, distorted by loose language, political agendas, emotive forms of persuasion, pressures that can often be more effective, it now seems, in shaping public opinion than conventional debate. I'll explore issues of this kind in this paper by looking at various works mentioned in my recently published book, Print and Prize, Travels in the Commonwealth. Now, if truth is a value, it is because the point made by a speaker is true, not because it takes courage to say it aloud, although that 
is important. It is not enough that the matter in issue is generally accepted as true or is thought to be true because it has never been tested by widespread and forthright discussion. To be of any real worth, it must actually be true. Now, there have, of course, always been various degrees of untruth. There are lies and half-truths. At a lesser level, euphemisms are often used to soften unwelcome truths. A mean-spirited deceased is called, quote, the loved one, unquote. A slanging match is described as, quote, robust debate, unquote. Treasury officials characterise a cut in funding as an efficiency dividend. Skillful speakers may emphasise facts and matters suiting their case to such an extent that a misleading picture is created. Reshaping reality by using supposedly innocuous phrases is increasingly rife in the political arena. A spokesman for President Trump, you may recall, coined the phrase alternative facts as a way of presenting an issue in a more favourable light. Donald Trump himself has constantly used the term fake news to brush aside damaging allegations as if the truth of a matter is always malleable. These sleights of hand are generally prompted by some underlying purpose that is thought to outweigh or to justify a reconfiguration of the truth. It follows that in weighing up the value of an assertion, people are entitled to look closely at the speaker's interest in the matter, and they usually do. So what is meant by the term truth-telling? Is it referring to truths that simply have to be told, a definition contended for by some activists, or is it describing a process of getting at the truth? One way or another, it leaves an impression that truths have not been told in the past and that some underlying purpose is now being served, especially when used in the context of post-colonial critiques. This is evidenced in Australia by the voice referendum. The term was used in the Uluru Statement in conjunction with the proposal for a voice, often described as a voice to Parliament, but in fact a proposed voice to various levels of government. Rejection of the voice proposal has left in its wake, unfortunately, not only a welter of allegations about the so-called use of misinformation in the course of the referendum campaign, but also uncertainty concerning the purpose of so-called truth-telling. The surrounding circumstances in that context leave little doubt as a matter of inference that the desire of, speakers, the desire of speakers pressing for truth telling is to improve the prospects of people living in Aboriginal communities and of others said to be of Aboriginal descent. This in turn suggests that the process will be focused principally upon stories pointing to maladministration and other grievances with a view to advancing claims for relief. To what extent will evidence to the contrary be considered? The Uluru Statement reads in part as follows, and I quote, we seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history." Unquote. Quite clearly then, the purpose underlying the proposed truth telling process is empowerment. It follows from earlier discussion that questions must then arise as to whether the underlying purpose, the push for empowerment, will affect what speakers say to the proposed commission. Can what is said during the process be safely treated as the truth? 
not because it suits what is thought to be a noble purpose, but because it is supported by verifiable facts and is actually true. Will the purpose shape the verdict? These cautionary observations lead to some other concerns, including not only the nature of post-colonial critiques, but also to a consideration of what is presently taking place in the Commonwealth of Nations. The Commonwealth is comprised essentially of former British colonies, most of which are now fully independent states. If advances have taken place in these lands, especially since the formation of the United Nations in 1945, with the result that people have secured a rightful place in their own countries, independently of Makarata commissions or the like, then this will probably bear upon the weight to be given to stories told to a truth-telling commission and upon what is required to remedy matters complained of in years to come. With these thoughts in mind, let me turn to George Orwell's novel, Animal Farm. The title sounds innocuous. It purports to be a story about disagreements between various animals on a farming property. Upon a closer look, however, it can be easily decoded as a profound allegory about revolution and the way in which societies can slide into authoritarian rule, a slippage disguised by a corruption of language, as in the commandment approved by the powers that be in the final pages of the novel, quote, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, unquote. All will return to this theme in his later work, 1984, in which he coined the term newspeak, an apparently benign term suggestive of looking to the future in a positive way, but in fact used to disguise what was actually taking place, including the substitution of falsity for truth in whatever way Big Brother decided until the so-called Ministry of Love becomes a place of torture. While pondering the nature of truth and the way in which reality can be reshaped by descriptive ingenuity, it is worth keeping in mind also some remarks forming part of Orwell's introduction to Animal Farm, in which readers are reminded that what is said to be the truth of a matter isn't necessarily shaped by authoritarian decrees. Orwell said, quote, at any given moment, there is an orthodoxy, a body of ideas which it is assumed all right-thinking people will accept without question. It is not exactly forbidden to say this or that or the other, but it is not done to say it. Just as in mid-Victorian times, it was not done to mention trousers in the presence of a lady. Anyone who challenges the prevailing orthodoxy finds himself silenced with surprising effectiveness. Now, it will probably strike many Australian readers and perhaps some in this audience that Orwell's remarks about the effect of orthodoxies can be regarded as having a particular resonance in recent times. Early on in the voice campaign, as I mentioned earlier, the sanctimonious tone adopted by various influential bodies and shapers of opinion had the unfortunate side effect of shaming people into silence. The proposed change to the constitution became virtually undiscussable or discussable only in whispers. The orthodoxy in many places, especially elite inner city electorates, was that all decent, right-thinking people would favour the creation of a new advisory body for Aboriginal people, notwithstanding valid concerns about the effect of such a change on the existing parliamentary structure. It was simply not done and possibly racist to mention any doubts about the proposal. 
Now, academics and lawyers are generally well accustomed to persuasive arguments being put on both sides of significant issues, especially legal issues as to which specialised knowledge is vital. But no, on this occasion, subject of very few exceptions, bar associations, law societies, and vast numbers of academics and influential judicial figures made it clear that in their opinion, an affirmative vote was the compassionate way to go, the right thing to do, the decent thing, irrespective of parliamentary traditions reflecting the egalitarian ideal of equality between all citizens. This conformity, this strange conformity of opinion might suggest that the case for constitutional change was so compelling in law and as a matter of common decency that it simply had to be approved. On the other hand, within professions accustomed to both spirited debate and dispassionate analysis, and where it turned out in the end that nearly 61% of the electorate as a whole opposed the change, this strange conformity of opinion seems surprisingly incongruous, as if, in an Orwellian mood, within the senior ranks of the academic and legal elites, there was a widespread acceptance that to vote against the proposed change simply wasn't the done thing. Money from the big end of town early on suggested a similar compliant mindset. One way or another, and not surprisingly perhaps given the status of these influential and generally respected leaders of opinion, it seems likely that a good many ordinary people felt obliged to keep their mouths shut. Well aware, no doubt, notwithstanding the nation's frequently voiced respect for freedom of speech, that doubts or queries about the proposal could lead to accusations of racism or other repercussions. It would be unwise and possibly prejudicial to one's career or standing with friends and family members, especially those of the younger generation on university campuses, to voice doubts or to say it's okay to vote now, no, to vote no. If there is any force in this interpretation of the relevant events, it is a disquieting reminder that in the end, the work, words and workings of a constitution will often be subject to the trends and prevailing orthodoxies of the day, including instances of emotive coercion. On this occasion, as it happened, the clear decision of the 61% majority outweighed the mindset in the elite professions and electorates. But the incongruity of what occurred, the presence of a strange pervasive conformity in places and in professions where this would not usually be expected, brings me now to the importance of literary works in casting iconoclastic light on a compliant scene and on what goes on beneath the surface. Creative works may reflect current trends or pervasive sentiments, but they aren't subservient to them. Novels and plays allow room for wide-ranging responses to controversial issues, independence in the face of conformity. Works of fiction, such as Orwell's Animal Farm in 1984, can often convey profound insights into what is actually happening, insights encouraging the reader, after stripping away the veneer of fiction, to say, yes, that's how it is, that's what's going on, that's the reality. In this case, the flexible nature of the line between fact and fiction can stimulate debate and pave the way to change. Now, skillful storytellers uh, I put to you often show how things actually are in memorable ways. They can reveal underlying flaws in systems that are said to be working. They can expose linguistic glosses that might lead us astray. 
They can use satire to puncture thought bubbles and pretensions. They can bring to light complexities and deeper truths that might otherwise be overlooked. In the contentious human rights era, we have become accustomed to so many matters immediately becoming subject to legal proceedings and legalistic analysis. One must keep in mind, however, that lawyers, including judicial officers, will benefit by reading widely and exercising common sense. Works of fiction about contentious issues can be useful in keeping the legal mind alert to underlying social trends, changing patterns of right and wrong, constructive approaches to ambiguous events. A mind attuned to a wide range of possibilities may be better placed to review the available evidence and respective arguments and or orthodoxies keenly and with insight than a mind accustomed to sticking simply to what might otherwise be accepted complacently as the facts of a matter. The language of human rights in contemporary times and the pronouncements of post-colonial critics, lawyers and advocates of truth-telling are often framed in abstract or general terms, as if what is said will be universally applicable in much the same way to most situations. There is a consequential danger that truth-telling projects of the kind taking place elsewhere or envisaged by the Uluru Statement will finish up serving a familiar purpose with a predetermined outcome. There is a need to look further afield, recognising that the individual voice and the habits of a particular society lie deep. The requirements of multicultural communities in the modern world are affected by a variety of sensitivities and demands for empowerment. Each of these must be fully considered and brought to account. According to Matthew Arnold in a poem about the many forces at work upon us, he said this, below the stream as light of what we think we feel, there flows with noiseless current strong, obscure and deep, the central stream of what we feel indeed." Unquote. In other words, to get a convincing picture of what is going on in society at any moment, one needs to look not only at official reports compiled by commissions of inquiry, but also at works reflecting hidden feelings, for these, like votes in a secret ballot, such as the voice referendum, as in, as, and, and as in the eventual outcome of voice re referendum, may turn out to be crucial in showing what feelings and related truths lie below the surface and may have to be heeded in planning for the future. Works of fiction by entrance for the Commonwealth Writers Prize in my time as chair of the prize illuminate these issues, including the effects of history upon the distribution and exercise of power. Kate Grenville, local Australian author, in her novel, The Secret River, traces the fortunes of a convict brought up in the harsh world of the 18th century London waterfront. He lays claim eventually to a patch of wilderness on the outlying Hawkesbury River in New South Wales, the colony of New South Wales. The author paints a convincing picture of a determined man who has arrived at the convict settlement with nothing and will not easily be persuaded to give up a piece of land he now regards as his own. The scene is set for a dreadful confrontation between this man and others like him and the original inhabitants of the area he seeks to colonise. To present the outcome simply as a tale of villainy would represent a failure to acknowledge the complexities of the novel in dealing with the inevitable effects of European expansion, the restlessness of human nature the flow of history. Inevitably, the novel casts light on the Aboriginal grievances and the consequential search for empowerment underlying the voice referendum. This brings me to The Native Commissioner by Sean Johnson from South Africa. His book touches upon Orwellian themes but in a realistic manner as the reader is gradually drawn into the corrupting world of the apartheid regime. 
The native commissioner at the heart of the story, George Jamison, is a kind and conscientious man. He joins the South African Department of Native Affairs during the era when his linguistic skills and familiarity with indigenous customs provided him with opportunities to fulfill his dream of balanced race relations. When the National Party is swept into office after the war, the mood in the bureaucracy changes. Jamison's skill at mastering tribal language in far places is not appreciated. The Bantu is seen as an, quote, unperson. Jamison's attempts to ameliorate the injustices of the system lead him to a state of crippling depression, then to suicide. The book, the novel, breaks new ground in showing how the apartheid rule injured even those working for it by the gradual erosion of their humanity. It shows also the way in which power can be exercised not only via the statutes and decrees of a governing regime, but also by utilising emotive coercion to entrench conformity of outlook, until people generally feel they have to step to the music of approved opinion. But when the old values are in a state of flux due to instability or unreality at the time, other issues arise. It often becomes difficult, in the absence of clear rules, to discern what is the prevailing opinion or orthodoxy. This brings me to a prize-winning novel set in Australia, The Slap by Christos Ziolkis. An apparently minor incident at a barbecue, an irritated parent slaps the child of another parent, plants a seed of dissension that leads to a breakup of friendships, festering hostilities and legal proceedings. The ill-fated disciplinary slap precipitates a major and long-running disagreement as to whether such an act can be justified. The story demonstrates the volatile nature of contemporary social attitudes in this country, a division of outlook that brings more than strictly legal issues into play. A similar but more violent show of disagreement is to be found in U.M. Akpan's book, Say You're One of Them. In that story, a teenage lad called Jubril has booked a seat on a bus to Nigeria. The passengers on his bus come from many fractious, war-torn areas. So he uses a jacket to conceal the fact that one of his hands has recently been amputated because he was convicted of stealing. Upon boarding the bus, Jubril finds that an aged African chieftain is occupying his designated seat. In this post-colonial setting, some of the younger surrounding passengers insist that the chieftain give the boy his seat, pursuant to Christian values and the new democratic principle of equal status. Others support the chieftain's traditional authority. Police officers arrive to restore order on the pragmatic basis that the bus must leave on time. The turmoil escalates when Jubril's amputation and thus his Muslim identity is exposed. Muslim passengers come to his aid, but not enough to protect him. Terrified, the teenage boy heeding his family's advice about the ways of the world reckons that the safest course is always to say you're one of them. So he is willing now to abide by whatever is determined by the majority opinion around him, even the chieftain's opinion. But in this case, as the fierce debate rages to and fro along the corridor of the bus, Jubril can't work out which is the dominant opinion, or which side to join, or who is likely to prevail. In the end, when an argumentative soldier comes to his aid, the two of them are dragged outside to have their throats slit so the bus can get going on its way. The story suggests that in a fractious setting, without clear rules, emotive coercion is an unpredictable and volatile force and chaos is always close to hand. The tumult aboard a crowded bus with so many voices in the ring is reminiscent of turmoil in the contemporary world's Tower of Babel a world challenged by a cacophony of strident opinions on social media 
and from giant self-serving corporations. In the Indian writer Radha Dasgupta's novel Solo, the head of, a security, the head of security systems at a, a fictional company called Struction is described in this way, and I quote, it was a role for which she was superbly qualified. New York boardrooms had never heard anyone speak so nonchalantly about snipers, chemical weapons and truck bombs, and on her lips this breezy militarism seemed not retrograde, but futuristic, even profound. Everyone wanted a piece of her advice." Unquote. Are there more positive or constructive themes to be, as I begin to round off my talk, so let me put this question, are there more positive or constructive themes to be found in recent Commonwealth literature? Fortunately, there are. Uh, I touch on this uh, in uh, the book Print and Prize and various examples, but for present purpose, uh, purposes, I will turn to Lloyd Jones's novel, Mr. Pip. In that case, the story opens in New Guinea when closure of a copper mine has precipitated a political upheaval, as in Bougainville, in reality. The men of the village are forced to look for work elsewhere. The depletion of services accompanying these events lead, leads to the only remaining white man in the village being recruited to act as a teacher. This eccentric loner's reading from the Dickens novel Great Expectations takes such a hold upon the minds of the villagers that when rebel troops arrive to subjugate the area, they hear of Mr. Pip and immediately conclude that he is a real person. They send for him, they search, and when he doesn't appear, they burn the villagers' houses. The houses are rebuilt. Mr. Pip lives on as a story recollected in the minds of the local inhabitants. In this way, we are led to believe that the invisible resources of the imagination will outlive the uncomprehending power of those who, nothing, who know nothing of Mr. Pip and of his kind. The search for the fictitious Mr. Pip has had dire, but also life-enhancing consequences. This powerful work of fiction looks beyond the brutal exercise of power by transient power brokers and suggests that ordinary people have the capacity to rebuild their societies and retrieve the fruits of civilization. The voices of ordinary people may be wiser and more significant in the end than those of power brokers and opinion formers. In the work of another prize winner, The Memory of Love by Aminata Fauna about the Civil War in Sierra Leone, the author explores powerful themes of redemption and reconciliation. The title points to an evocation of what once was and could have been. This author also underlines the need, even by those who have emerged from the cauldron of dispossession and upheaval, to cultivate a tone of reason and equanimity in charting a way forward. So the works I've been discussing are concerned in part with the formation and gradual shaping of opinions. They are works about what happens when someone holds the wrong opinion or a country goes in the wrong direction. They cast light upon a matter of importance to the Commonwealth, namely the preservation of certain crucial rights the freedom to hold differing opinions, the freedom to speak freely. It will therefore now be useful to close by saying just a few more words about such matters, although it will be apparent from what I have said thus far that unlike the authors of legal texts about human rights and the need for truth-telling as an aid to empowerment, I'm interested not so much in the formal definition of rights or the process of enforcement but in social attitudes that bear upon freedom of speech, the informal pressures that lead to a troubling conformity of thought, even in the contentious professions, such as the legal profession, and in the prevailing orthodoxies that may eventually be imposed by an individual's own inner censor. Freedom of speech will be illusory if we all hold or are expected to hold the same opinion. Too often we are prepared to overlook this fact. In social situations, conformity has always been with us, brought about too often by long-standing social habits or by inertia. 
in the case of political correctness, correctness, an outlook that was supposed to nurture the expression of dissenting opinions, is now paradoxically inclined to stifle that expression. This is why the works of our greatest writers remain essential to our social well-being. They respond to change, but they make us ponder. In holding up a mirror to life, their task is to inform, to challenge, and to enlighten. It was clear to me upon agreeing to chair the Commonwealth Writers' Prize that a prize linked to what was thought to be a reactionary body was bound to be disdained in various virtue signalling literary quarters. I like to think, however, that others on the literary scene would be more open mind. The prize served a number of beneficial purposes, including not only interactions with educational bodies and financial rewards for deserving writers, but also recognition and publishing opportunities that might otherwise be unavailable. It may now strike some readers and some amongst you that one of the best ways to try and understand another country is to relate what seems to be happening elsewhere to what is happening or taking shape in one's own country. A task more easily accomplished where there are matters in common, such as language or laws or social customs, as in many former British colonies. The culture's culture and distinctive ways are precious. They will change and mature as time goes by, but they will be ill-served by simply nurturing grievances from the past. The process of change must be constantly renewed by looking forward with an awareness that much of value is shaped beneath the surface of daily life. Voices involved only in public debate, affected only by current orthodoxies and short-term goals, often sound shallow. The small personal voice of a creative writer makes its presence felt at a deeper and more enduring level. It shapes its own accent, its own melody. So let me close by recalling the well-known words of Thoreau, quote, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears, however measured or far away. Uh, many thanks, Nicholas Hasluck. Uh, so we come to questions and discussion. And as I said, there are copies of print and prize Travels in the Commonwealth uh, available and also later on our website. So um, you ran the Commonwealth Literary Prize from 2006 to 2011. Uh, well, when you started off, it's nearly two decades ago now. Um, what was a white guy like you doing in a, a post-colonial operation like this? I mean, <laughs> how did you get away with it? And would, would you be able to do it now? You come up here. All right. and, uh, well, thank you for that question, uh, and it's a very fair question. Oddly enough, um, I mean, um, implicit in, in Jared's question is the fact that the Commonwealth is changing in such a way, as in this country, there is quite a uh, significant uh, sense of um, bias or um, suspicion or even uh, reservation about the habits of the what might be well, formally described as the more dominant uh, colonial co colonies such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Br and Britain ways and so on. So that was in the air and you might, and, and, and certainly prompts the sort of question you've just asked. But uh, oddly enough, the short answer is, is rather of a rather more practical or pragmatic kind. The Commonwealth Writers' Prize is administered by the Commonwealth Foundation, which is a, a limb of the Commonwealth Secretari Secretariat in London. It had been operating out of London for many years, and the organisation of the Writers' Prize had been uh, vested in the office bearers there. And there was the kind of feeling which your question uh, uh, signifies, that people thought, well, look, really, there's a need for a change of structure. But oddly enough, at that time, uh, Macquarie Bank was enthused by the director of the Commonwealth Foundation, Mark Collins, to invest some money into this uh, enterprise because the new director, Mark Collins, was determined not to simply be relying upon contributions from the 51 or so, 53 or so Commonwealth countries, 
but from other sources and donors and benefactors. He managed to interest the Macquarie Bank in Australia. Warwick Smith, I think, was, the, uh, was very central to those events, as was Richard uh, Alston, the minister at the time. So the long and short was that a considerable amount of money was put into uh, carrying the prize forward for the next three or four years and renegotiation and so on. Now, I don't think that of itself meant that an Australian was going to be appointed to chair the committee. I like to think, perhaps in the mood of immodesty, that I had some uh, qualities on my side which were added to the equation, but uh, perhaps because I'd been involved as chair of the literature board in this country and perhaps the presence of this Australian money, as I described, led to the equation coming together in a way which meant that uh, uh, people were willing to have me serve as chair of the prize. But uh, tensions were there as an undercurrent, I do have to say, not in any, in, fortunately in my time, not in, in, in any particular fractious or uh, unpleasant way, but uh, that mood was always there that there's too much influence in the old white colonies and uh, the balance should change. And in a way, the balance has changed because the uh, Commonwealth has now, the Commonwealth Prize has now been reconstituted. And when I last looked at it, I've been out of it for some years now, but when I last looked, most of the judges and so on were uh, from the, the African countries and other parts of the Commonwealth. Is it, is it still called the Commonwealth Prize? Um, it is still called the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, but now it is essentially a prize um, it was formerly in two categories, a best book and a best first book. It's now been reduced to a best first book, and essentially they are looking for emerging writers rather than people like Kate Grenville and Christus Siolkis and some of those well-known names, both of whom have, uh, are very well-known indeed. Any fellows questions? Yeah, there's one down there, Just getting back on uh, the intolerance, <coughs> pardon me, um, I know during the Vietnam War we had a lot of trouble on campuses and that, and uh, now we have the pro-Palestinian people. I noticed when some of them were asked about Hamas, some of them had to ask the interviewer what Hamas was. When they asked, well, what river are you talking about and what sea, they couldn't name them. What does that say about the stand of debate that we're getting into when abuse seems to be more important than rational debate? Well, a very pertinent question, and uh, I suppose, to my mind, it uh, hooks into the theme I've been discussing, because what you're describing is a conformity of opinion of an even worse kind that, than what I was describing. I was describing what I thought was a surprising conformity of opinion in the legal profession, but at least lawyers in deciding not to stand up and be heard, I think you'd be fairly confident, no matter whether they were taking uh, uh, much interest uh, in the issue of the voice referendum or not, at least would have an understanding of the issues. And I think one could be fairly confident that they decided not to make a noise about this or that and just go along with what was happening. At least they sort of knew the implications, but in what you're describing, which I think is indeed a fair description on some of the things that uh, clips on television and so on I see, is really a kind of a mindless conformity. And I think that is even more worrying because an informed conformity is worrying, but at least with professions, I think there is some prospect of changing minds. But if you just get a kind of mob, mindless conformity, then anything can happen. When you think about yours and your father's background and the British influence throughout the world in the Commonwealth, it seems to me that there is no equal to the positive outcome, whether it's in India today or in the world at large, where the British Enlightenment influence has been by far the best thing that could have happened to humanity over the last 300 years. I'd like your comments on that very big issue. <laughs> well, it, it is a very big issue. I, I must say the general um, tenor of what you've been saying is one I share. I think it is, there has been so much uh, in the era of self-determination since the winds of change of, in, in Africa, which Macmillan orchestrated in the 1960s, 
Uh, since that time, there's been so much uh, emphasis, and in the United Nations particularly, upon indigenous, uh, the indigenous focus, the need for self-determination, and there's some validity in all of that, of course, but it has meant a rather unbalanced debate as people overlook uh, the positives of the uh, British colonial endeavour, which includes very centrally uh, a respect for the rule of law and uh, a respect for parliamentary traditions and institutions. And uh, in this book, um, I describe my move not only around various countries, not only to do with the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, but related things. And in places like Penang and Malaya and Singapore, I was writer in residence in Singapore for some months, one was constantly meeting lawyers, who many of whom had been trained at the Inns of Court in London and so forth, and there were all those connections in the legal profession. People were speaking a common language, they understood each other, and a lot of those have found their way into governmental positions and so on. So that has been, I think, a great contribution to the way in which these uh, countries organise their affairs. There are obviously pockets of hostility to this and that, but that's inevitable. But per perhaps I come back to two points. It was interesting, of course, N Nehru in India, uh, the first Prime Minister, was a Harrow-educated uh, person and deeply steeped uh, in those things. But it was interesting that Nehru was fairly determined to establish a secular state conscious of the sheer teeming multiplicity of religions and sects in that country. And by and large, uh, he has been fairly successful, well not he, but he and his uh, successors with a similar mindset have been fairly, fairly successful in keeping that immensely diverse country together. And of course there are constant strains and changes. But uh, now I share the sort of view that uh, you're expressing there. and. Uh, uh, the cover of your book, I think you took the photograph, uh, looks pretty nice in Jamaica somewhere, sitting under the sun and uh, someone else is paying. <laughs> tell, us, tell us you, um, you had a few clashes in you, I think Sussy, I pronounce it Sussy Trahor, comes up in your book, he's a pretty lively sort of guy, isn't he? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, um, well, just tell us who he is first. Yeah. Okay, well, Sashi Tharoor, and this comes back to India in a way. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sashi Tharoor is a, a skilled lawyer and a, with an acad high, high academic background, a writer also. He wrote a novel that won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. But he spent many years in the United Nations. He's a man, I suppose, now in his late 50s, something of that kind. Many years at the United Nations. I think uh, at the rank close to deputy to the Secretary General and there's some talk of him becoming Secretary General. But for one reason or another that didn't prevail. He came back to India and became a member of the uh, Indian Parliament. So I first met him at the Commonwealth Writers' Prize final event when prizes were presented and he was the uh, uh, keynote speaker. And he was a most charismatic man. He spoke beautifully. I've never heard such an effortless oration done without a single note and such an urbane and attractive and uh, wonderful fellow and uh, I got to know him to some extent on that fairly brief sort of acquaintance. Uh, so that's um, where I got to know him and such an urbane man that uh, in a way many of his personal and deeply held opinions might be somewhat disguised by the sheer urbanity of the man. So we got along famously but as some of you in this audience might be aware in recent years and uh, since he was involved in some parliamentary controversies, he's been writing a number of books, some of which are very deeply critical of the whole British imperial endeavour. In fact, you might even say he's one of the leading voices condemning the whole British uh, imperial endeavour. But So I suppose I'm uh, describing that dilemma we often have in life as a man. He was a most attractive, congenial fellow but uh, he has these deeply held views and uh, quite a following in, in that opinion. Yes, he visited us at the Sydney Institute some years ago. We met him in New York as well, so. Um, lively guy, but changed a bit in recent years. Geoffrey. Uh, Nick, uh, would you like to compare uh, the British Commonwealth with the French colonies? Uh, in particular, the fact that France has always had much more centralized power the Ecole Supérieure and all these types of in things. They also imposed the CFA, the, the, uh, the, uh, this uh, 
Frank on uh, their f former African colonies. And we're also seeing a, an interesting uh, development in New Caledonia that uh, uh, the British would have got out of New Caledonia uh, a, a long time ago, but uh, the French uh, linger on. But uh, I'm just wondering if you've got any uh, any views as to the difference uh, and perhaps uh, if uh, uh, India had been French, uh, whether we would have had a different outcome. <laughs> <laughs> we get back to the question as to whether the, rain, the trains would have run on time and that sort of thing. But, uh, well, coming to your question, Geoffrey, well, I mean, as people in the audience probably know, I mean, France had a large uh, colonial empire, but uh, with the passage of time, they still now retain Martinique in the Caribbean and, of course, New Caledonia and Réunion, close to Mauritius. And uh, so to that extent, some of those former colonies, uh, I suppose essentially remain as colonies because they are part of the French uh, regime, if you like. I just don't think I've, quite, I mean, I've been to New Caledonia and to Martinique, as a matter of fact, and of course they're colorful countries with their own uh, wonderful charm. But I, I have to say, frankly, I just don't think I've quite got the competence. My impression is the uh, British insistence upon the rule of law and those characteristics of the Westminster style of government we're so accustomed to have served places better, partly because encouraging freedom of speech, you get a greater uh, tolerance of views and so on. My impression is that that's a different mindset in the French uh, remaining colonies and in previous times. And of course, Devil's Island, I think, was one of the French colonies, as we know from the novel Papillon. But I just don't think I can express a very profound impression. The, uh, the counter question would be, would the world be different if France was <coughs> run by the English? Is the other way of looking at it. <laughs> but I won't ask you to ask that. Quel horreur. <laughs> I've got a call from, uh, a message on the Zoom from Mike in Canberra and says, it's about you and others. And he said, and you're being a judge, but what are these judges doing? He writes, um, writing novels. He mentions Ian Kellen, and uh, he said it's a bit more spicy than your stuff, Ian's books, right. uh, the former High Court judge, and you. I mean, is it that boring giving judgments on a court that you've got to go home and write novels? Or aren't, aren't there any gin and tonics at home? Uh, well, I, kn I know Ian well, and I think while he was serving as a judge, he man did manage to write one or two novels, and they are very good ones. And so he might have a different cast of mind to me, but I have to say the moment I got onto the bench, I mean, I've been writing novels for years, but the moment I got onto the bench, I just have to say very directly to you that uh, time just evaporated. I just, um, I was working seven days a week if I was writing anything, it was always a judgment. Uh, th but the one, so, but, uh, so the point, but the point is, I'm, I'm fairly serious about the point that I've made in the talk tonight that uh, throughout my career as both a lawyer and writer, I have tried to emphasise and still instil the thought in other members of the legal profession that there is an advantage of trying to think outside the framework of strict legal rules. And in my case, before I got overborne by the nature of judicial work, uh, that thought was in my mind as I turned my mind to writing novels while still practicing law. I was busy then, but never quite as horrifically busy as I was a judge. Although the thing I did do, um, which you may possibly be aware of, the moment I stepped onto the bench, I thought, well, look, this is going to be interesting, challenging, etc. Don't have time for creative fiction, but I will keep a diary. And I kept a, a very extensive diary over the 10 years I was on the bench, and in recent years I've edited those and brought them out. One is called Bench and Book, one is called Fact and Fiction. And they are, the picture I want to pr pr present is so many lawyers of a senior kind, and particularly the leading known judicial figures, bring out uh, worthy works, but they're always written in a rather detached sort of tone as though there's this uh, pitch of equanimity and balance and so on. But I wanted to describe the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of being a judge where you're trying to write, dictate one judgment when 10 minutes later you're going to step into court and start providing an extemporary judgment and there's a lot of haste and bustle and pressure. But other people in the room know these pressures. <laughs> 
Commonwealth Prize. We had a big debate here about what an Australian novel was a few years back. What are you looking for in the writers for the Commonwealth Prize? Does the word Commonwealth have any play? And have you noticed a change when you were there in this post-colonial discussion era of what the sort of issues were that novelists were putting forward? Yes. Uh, well, and thank you very much for that question because it actually brings me back to what I was saying a moment ago. Um, while I was in charge of the prize, two categories I mentioned, best book, best first book, we, the, the criteria which were um, in a code, shall we say, were really that it should be a work by a writer based in a common, based or a citizen of a Commonwealth country for a work of literary merit. And so that essentially was the uh, ordained criteria and we stuck to that. But there was always a tremendous undercurrent of pressure of the kind I was mentioning earlier by people saying, look, if you're applying that sort of criterion, it means that there's going to be a preponderance of Canadians like Alice Munro and you know Margaret Atwood and these very distinguished writers and from Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we in the lesser known colonies are getting a bit sick and tired of all that and we ought to change the criteria and some of that discussion is reflected in this book. We ought to change the criteria to give value to uh, works that are explicitly articulating post-colonial issues and disappointments and grievances and so on. Well, um, I must confess I, uh, I was not very persuaded by that, although I think mine was a minority voice in the end, because literary merit is a strain. People have hard, hard difficulty defining it. But it's very, not so, well, it's not easy, but to write a worthy book, which everyone says, well, that's not a theme which really is very current and it's good you tackled it and it's all very cogent and rational and articulate, but it's never the same as a book which for some invisible kind of reason just sort of grips the soul that operates below the radar. And uh, that's always been my approach to literary literature generally, that uh, the best novels are really touching on feelings and emotions we didn't know we had sort of thing. So. Uh, must have been pretty well right on time, so uh, I just should say, because uh, we always run to time here, um, so many thanks. Print and Prize, Travels in the Commonwealth by Nicholas Hasluck, uh, uh, lawyer, judge, novelist. Thanks for coming again here to today and um, good luck with the success of the book and thanks for a in very informative talk. Many thanks. Thank